Welcome everyone to the University of Minnesota China Center's Considering China webinar. I'm John Brzezinski, I'm the director of the China Center. Thank you for your support of the China Center and the Considering China webinar series. I'm offering a special thanks to Kaime and Joseph Terry for their general support of this program. I ask that you also please consider a gift to the China Center Considering China webinar series. You may find a link on the webinar announcement and on our website um, to do so. I'll invite Haiyan Wang, the Associate Director of the China Center, to introduce our speaker for today. Haiyan? Thank you, John. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Haiyan Wang. I'm the Associate Director of, I'm sorry. Can you see me? I'm the Associate Director of the China Center. And then today, it's my great honor to introduce Professor Andrew Mursa, who is my former colleague, friend, and supervisor at Cornell University. Professor Andrew Mursa is the George and Sadi Hyman Professor of China Studies, Director of the China Studies Program, and the Director of the SAIS China Global Research Center at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, Science. From 2019 to 2021, Mursa served as the Vice Dean for Faculty Affairs and International Research Corporation at SAIS, he is formerly a professor of government at Cornell University and an assistant professor of political science at Washington University in St. Louis. Professor Murtha specializes in Chinese bureaucratic politics, political institutions, and the domestic and foreign policy process. More recently, he has extended his research interests to include Cambodia. Professor Murtha has written three books, on the politics of piracy, intellectual property in contemporary China, China's water warriors, citizen action and policy change, and brothers in arms, Chinese aid to the Khmer Rouge from 1975 to 1979. Now, without further ado, please, Professor Murtha. Thank you so much, Haiyan. Thank you, Joan, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Haiyan, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you to all of you for uh, for attending. Um, I'm delighted to be here and uh, I'll let me just jump right into it. So Haiyan, if you don't mind um, uh, uh, hooking us up with the PowerPoint, I'll, I'll get started. So since uh, Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, China's expanded its global reach in ways unimaginable. Uh, so just, um, can you see the slides, right? I can. I, I think you have the um, um, the. I think just just uh, do the um, the normal view, the slideshow view. Perfect. Thanks, Hayan. So um, until the COVID outbreak in 2019-2020, uh, uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, and other economic and developmental engagements dominated media coverage on China. Um, although BRI is being recalibrated these days, uh, China's global ambitions are not. A widespread narrative has emerged that China was and is an inexorable, unstoppable rising power that would easily dominate the world, a narrative that has profoundly shaped U.S. policy. Uh, that's certainly the case where I'm speaking from here in, in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, in today's presentation, what I'd like to do is take a different view. Uh, I argue that Chinese domestic institutions, that is, the politics embedded in its domestic bureaucratic and institutional landscape, are increasingly becoming a key factor in explaining China's international behavior. This is significant because the Chinese state is, contrary to conventional wisdom, and as I will argue today, decentralized, fragmented, and often uncoordinated, leading to all sorts of domestic institutional pathologies and policy failures. In essence, along with investment, technology, and an expatriate workforce, China is also exporting its domestic political problems abroad mm -hmm. with negative consequences in these target countries. Uh, can I have the next uh, slide, Haiyan? Uh, oh, the next one after that. Thanks. Um, so 
given all this, uh, the conventional wisdom is that uh, there's been a, a dramatic shift in China's influence generating mechanisms, uh, the development of a blue water navy, the building of, uh, of offshore uh, islands and consolidation of power uh, within uh, the South China Sea and beyond. Uh, as I mentioned, there's been outward oriented investment, uh, chiefly through, although not exclusively through uh, the Belt and Road. But in addition to that, there have been other initiatives, such as the Safe Cities Program, uh, the Anquan uh, which is a, um, a way of exporting uh, its, um, uh, some of its uh, surveillance and uh, social uh, control mechanisms abroad. And the not unreasonable conclusion to all of this is that China is on the rise and that there's been little drag on China's global ambitions. And this, of course, leads to a certain set of policy prescriptions, uh, which may or may not be uh, correct uh, based on the assumptions on which they are uh, uh, derived. And there's increasingly uh, uh, hawkish rhetoric in Washington, D.C. that Beijing is ready to eat our lunch. Given all of this, it's not altogether unreasonable to conclude that China is inexorably on the trajectory of a rising power. Uh, but such a conclusion would lend itself um, uh, to, as I said, a certain way of looking at China in the world, one that I think um, is uh, can use a, 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 a significant uh, amount of potential retooling. So, Haiyan, if I can um, just have the... Um, so that's an example of, uh, 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 let's uh, go forward to a couple more slides, high end so I can, great, thank you. So uh, I'd spoken about this, uh, China in, in, in the security area, but also in terms of the, um, so uh, in terms of the economic and um, uh, um, uh, global investment uh, uh, areas as well, and particularly BRI. Um, so what is truly remarkable and breathtaking is the scope and vision of China's outward oriented investment to create markets, global infrastructure linkages, and to gain access to strategic and rare commodities and natural resources. Uh, can I have the next slide? I am. Thank you. So as BRI provides secure market access, new actors and entities complicate the situation with large uh, state-owned firms and often in collaboration with national agencies or subnational governments within China, uh, seizing economic opportunities abroad. As they expand to new markets, increase natural, natural resource extraction and establish competing manufacturing sites, they also attract many migrant entrepreneurs with little or no connection to or support from large firms or the national government but who nonetheless can have significant impact on Beijing's relations with a particular country or region. So let me just give, uh, start with an example, uh, 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 that of Ghana. So Ghana provides a fascinating window into the internationalization of the dynamic of in-country migration in China, except that it has now been ex extended beyond China's borders. Of note is the 2013 Galamse controversy involving illegal gold mining by Chinese actors in the West African country. What is particularly interesting about, uh, about this is that much of the origin of this fraught relationship can be traced back to not only a single uh, uh, province in, uh, in, in, in China, but to a single county, Xiangli, in the Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region, mm. itself a major subnational uh, player in BRI. Uh, if I can uh, get the next slide, Haiyan. Thanks very much. Shanglin County is the home of migrant workers who had traditionally worked in gold harvesting up in China's northeast during the 1990s. When those facilities closed, they returned home to a local economy that had pretty much little use for their professional skills. In the early 2000s, several of them ended up in Ghana, where they amassed a considerable fortune, returning to Shanglin as millionaires. The inevitable gold rush saw a ballooning of Chinese prospectors in West Africa. And some seven years after the first returnees started spreading the news in Shanglin County, West Africa had 50,000 Chinese expatriates, two thirds of whom came from that single county, Shanglin, and with active support 
and their local government. County government officials encouraged the growth of overseas mining industry by assisting prospective miners in acquiring passports and travel documentation, ignoring some of the dubious lending practices surrounding the mining ventures, and helping coordinate export of mining equipment to Shanglin miners in Ghana. The problem was that such mining was illegal in Ghana. Moreover, the use of heavy, heavy machinery and toxic chemicals, particularly mercury, not only underscored that the Chinese were outcompeting their Ghanaian counterparts, who focused more on artisanal mining, but also contributed to the considerable negative environmental and health effects of, Gollum, of their Gollum Sea practices. Unsurprisingly, resentment against the Chinese escalated into armed attacks, culminating in the shooting deaths of two Ghanaians by Chinese miners over a land dispute in Ashanti. Chinese social media was already replete with photos of Chinese workers killed or injured by Ghanaians. When the Chinese miners sought help from the Chinese embassy in Accra, they were turned away because their visas and paperwork, secured by the Shanglin County government on the miners' behalf, were not the proper working documents. As tensions escalated further, in May, a 14-person delegation of representatives from the Guangxi-Zhuang Autonomous Region government, including its foreign affairs office, met with Ghanaian officials. The latter demanded that the Chinese engaged in illegal mining leave the country immediately, while the Guangxi delegation proposed to provide technology transfers and provide sensitivity training to Shanglin residents. Demonstrating some tone deafness, the Chinese delegation criticized Ghanaian authorities for failing to protect the Chinese who had been engaged in that illegal activity. None of this succeeded in preventing a crackdown which began the following month. As the action proceeded, protests erupted in Shanglin, forcing the county and provincial authorities to send yet another delegation, this time also including officials from the Commerce and Public Security offices to negotiate the release of Chinese that had been taken into custody, as well as to arrange for the repatriation of some 4,500 Chinese miners. Quite apart from the negative, and can I have the next slide, uh, uh, Haiyan, thank you. Uh, um, so quite apart from the negative environmental and health effects, Chinese involvement in Gamzi in, in Ghana threatened the Chinese foreign policy priorities in Ghana, damaging uh, China's image and consequently straining efforts at fostering sino ghanaian relations with repercussions uh, throughout the uh, Western Africa. Collectively, their actions have not only impacted sino ghanaian engagements, but have also raised questions about Bre Beijing's broader foreign policy agenda in Africa. Can I have the next slide, Haiyan? And the next. So this does not exactly fit into this dominant narrative. So what exactly is going on here? Can I have the uh, the next slide? Thanks, Haiyan. So I argue that the Beltway echo chamber and public and increasingly uh, scholarly discourse over China, that is that the view that of, of an, a rise of unchecked Chinese global power and influence is simply wrong or at best incomplete. Instead, I argue that Chinese domestic institutions, the politics embedded in its domestic bureaucratic and institutional landscape, shape China's international behavior that is very much at odds with the dominant narrative of many China watchers. My thesis is that the effectiveness of Chinese foreign influence is only as good as the domestic institutions that manage the relationship, and that these institutions, grounded in Chinese domestic politics, are fragmented, uncoordinated, and often in conflict with Beijing's geopolitical priorities. So let's take a step back and Haiyan, can I have the next slide? And uh, um, I, I, I promise there won't be a test uh, at the end of this presentation. I know this is this slide is a little bit um, uh, uh, impenetrable, uh, but um, that's kind of the point. Um, the Chinese government apparatus extends into the most arcane policy areas and it's replicated at every level of the Chinese state, with some exceptions at the very bottom of the system. Each policy area has its own bureaucracies, and each of these has its own particular structure, administrative rank, formal and informal power bases, institutional history, corporate culture, 
an idiosyncratic approach to reaching its organizational goals. Bureaucratic competition over power and influence is baked into the system, which is characterized by bargaining and consensus building when it is working at its best, but is, is at least just as often defined by knockdown, drag out, infighting, bureaucratic fragmentation, and institutional inertia and atrophy. So who governs BRI strategy? Like most policy in China, it is coordinated by several key national level actors. The Ministry of Commerce, or MOFCOM, which supervises all foreign economic relations, including trade, investment, aid, and Chinese businesses overseas conduct, is one key player. But there are obvious areas of overlap with other agencies, which are loath to subsume themselves under MOFCOM's lead. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, MOFA, which is responsible for China's diplomatic relations, has a strong interest, yet no control over overseas state-owned enterprises. MOFA is the statutory body of China's foreign relations tasked with building positive external relations and supporting domestic development and stability. For MOFA, political relations trump short-term economic gains. Therefore, MOFA will place more emphasis on whether aid and investment projects serve broader political and diplomatic goals. The Ministry of Finance, MOF, on the other hand, allocates funding to be dispersed by China's ministries. Foreign aid project proposals need to be circulated to the Ministry of Finance for approval. In terms of direct funding, the Ministry of Finance covers the gap between commercial and concessional interest rates for Chinese policy banks, concessional loans that help Chinese firms go out. In addition, there are the state-owned banks. The China Export-Import Bank uh, supports trade by providing credit and insurance, and like MoCom, supports overseas Chinese business deals by providing aid and concessional funding. I can go on and on, but the point I'm trying to make here is that all of these entities uh, have different uh, goals and uh, means by uh, of achieving them that are based on their organizational mandates. And they can come up, they can and do come up against one another uh, when it comes to figuring out uh, the best way forward, um, uh, choosing which are the best projects to fund and how to support them once they're already underway. But there's been another wrinkle, uh, particularly under Xi Jinping, and that is a growing number of new Chinese Communist Party organizations that have emerged and have increasingly encroached upon policy areas traditionally and firmly under government jurisdiction. This additional layer is intended to cut through much of the institutional agency slack that exists within the system, but may well have the effect of further contributing to it. Uh, the most relative, uh, relevant of these uh, for this current discussion is the comprehensively deepening Leadership Small Group, or Zhongyang, Quanmian, Shenhua, Gaige, Lingdao, Shaozu. Each of these institutions has its own priorities and mandates, which can often conflict and, uh, with their partner institutions. Moreover, as articulated responsibilities are often vague, there's plenty of room to excessively liberally or conservatively interpret in institutions given scope of action. In practice, what this means is the Department of Foreign Aid within MOFCOM does not coordinate with MOFA. Chinese embassies and consulates report to MOFA, but the Economic Counselor's Office, formerly under the embassy, reports, reports directly to MOFCOM. MOFA visits to recipient countries are replicated or shadowed by MOFCOM with little meaningful coordination. And the China uh, uh, Export-Import Bank is under the Ministry of Finance, but also works closely with MOFCOM. Indeed, facilities uh, for development financing that enhance MOFCOM via purchases of Chinese goods. Uh, uh, Maiden and Ma identify in their study uh, 11 different ministerial agencies that influence Chinese energy policy and 11 with some jurisdiction over maritime affairs. Zhang and Smith count 33 agencies, among them the foreign aid apparatus. Um, and uh, if you want to uh, take this to its logical uh, or, or possibly even illogical conclusion, 
uh, the work by Anne Marie Brady on Chinese um, Arctic in, uh, Arctic um, policy includes some three dozen uh, bureaucracies. So this is something that uh, far from a well-oiled machine is something that is uh, fragmented um, and, um, uh, and largely uncoordinated, um, leading to all sorts of unforeseen consequences and unintended outcomes. Uh, can I ask for the next slide, Hyann? Oh, the one after that, sorry. Thank you. So uh, Chinese politics is also decentralized. Uh, for those of you who are um, uh, China uh, scholars, this um, may be uh, not come as a as a um, as a complete surprise, uh, but it is something that uh, raises eyebrows here in, in Washington D.C. These national level institutions that I've just described, already in conflict with an, uh, with uh, uh, one another, um, uh, are only one uh, administrative layer. Um, but uh, China is is um, is governed below the national level in ways that um, lead to uh, uh, a great deal of uh, of, of mis uh, uh, coordination. How exactly is China governed? Specifically, how are binding requirements from Beijing enacted, and what are the more propitious areas to work around? Dilute ignore, and even undermine a national policy at the local level. I think there are four things to consider when seeking out an answer. They are distinction, salience, direction, and aggregation. And I'll speak of all, all four of these. So the first has to do with authority relations in China. Simplifying considerably here, there are two sorts of these authority relations uh, in, 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 in the Chinese context. The first are, and I'm simplifying here, the first are binding leadership relations um, or lingda uh, guanxi. The second is non-binding consultative professional relations or ye wu guanxi. Thus, this first consideration is to distinguish between these two types of relations, binding and non-binding. The second dimension has to do with understanding the salience of these two sets of relations. Any administrative read government unit in China can have any number of relationships of non-binding professional relations, even with higher ranked units. However, it can only have binding or leadership relations with one single unit. The latter, the one with which, with which it has binding leadership relations, is the superior that the administrative unit in question must answer to which is useful, especially when it is exposed to a number of simultaneously conflicting orders. The third of these dimensions has to do with the direction of these critical leadership relations. If they are vertical in nature, that is, if the national level ministry can issue binding orders down to its functional counterpart at the provincial level, the next administrative level down from the center, and so on and so on, it has what can be called centralized leadership relations, or in the Chinese bureaucratic vernacular, leadership down a line, or tiaoshan lingdao. If, on the other hand, this ministerial counterpart at the provincial level, often a bureau, a ju or a ting, is established to follow its binding orders from the government at the same administrative level, in this case, the provincial government, such a relationship, such a horizontal leadership relationship, is called leadership across a piece, or kuaixiang lingdao, within the corridors of power in, in China. The direction of these authority relations are determined by uh, the direction of budgetary revenue, which I won't get into uh, in this presentation, through the mechanism of bianzhi. The fourth and final component is the aggregation of these horizontal and vertical sets of leadership relations throughout the bureaucratic mosaic. Contrary to what many may perceive, the Chinese government is overwhelmingly decentralized in nature, <coughs> excuse me, which is to say most leadership relations throughout the Chinese body politic are horizontal in nature, not vertical in nature. And this is important because the vast majority of economic actors involved in BRI are subnational ones. After a period of, of painful consolidation, the reduction of national level state-owned enterprises uh, has led to a manageable number of just 
just under 100 uh, 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 big SOEs, often in strategic sectors. These are powerful players in Chinese domestic politics. In China's political system, the directors of these large SOEs are interchangeable with commonly rotated and commonly rotated, <coughs> excuse me, into high ranking political positions, such as provincial governors and ministers. Aside from the personnel connections to the party state, the large SOEs are favored to implement China's foreign aid and government to government projects because they are state companies and generate revenue for the government and because they have the resources to implement the projects. Private companies that win projects such as Huawei are large enterprises with strong state links. But there are some 900 provincial level SOEs that are owned and supervised uh, by the provincial governments and in addition to that, there's some 112,000 smaller firms that are owned by lower level administrations. Furthermore, the, these all fall under the jurisdiction of their uh, local government uh, or their local governments uh, and local government agencies, um, not the national, not their national uh, counterparts. This is significant because prov uh, provincial level SOEs make up 88% of all Chinese firms investing abroad. Even more to the point, subnational governments interpret or ignore these kind of vague central regulations according to local conditions and interests. Lest we think that this applies only to traditional Chinese SOEs, differences between S local SOEs and local private enterprises is, neg is negligible certainly less than the difference between, say, <clears throat> central and local SOEs. The result of all of this, uh, all these functional, spatial, and administrative uh, 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 fragmentation <clears throat> uh, leads to a situation where what we see in China is something that we've seen in China for centuries, if not millennia. This notion that those, of, uh, those at the top have their policies, where we at the bottom have our countermeasures, or in Chinese, the difference today, <coughs> excuse me, is twofold and significant. First, as China extends its investment overseas, domestic politics no longer stops at water's edge, escaping the scrutiny of China's extensive super supervisory infrastructure, and thus contributing to a widening of informational asymmetries favoring subnational actors. And Beijing has less of an ability to rein these actors in. Second, these outcomes do not simply have consequences inside China. Uh, as uh, Minye's excellent work makes clear, they also have consequences for China's relations with third party countries as well, the, as well as for the domestic politics within those countries. Thus, fragmented authoritarian governance itself is being exported abroad. The consequences, however, are even more destabilizing, given that in China, domestic actors are all conversant with the rules, norms, language, and tools of the game, and thus are constrained by the other's knowledge of them. This is demonstrably not the case abroad, or if it is, it tends to dovetail with inefficient, rent-seeking, non-democratic norms of a given target country. This far more than the vague articulation of some generic third Chinese way is what the actual China model looks like. Can I have the next slide, Haiyan? And the one after that? And the one after that? Thank you. The PRC, and, and so the, the last uh, uh, point I want to make before I get into the case studies very quickly is that Chinese politics is local. The PRC, you know, so I've been talking about subnational actors and the, dim the, the dimensions between the dynamics between our subnational actors and, and, and those in Beijing. But the actual number of them is, is astonishing when we really think about it. And all of these actors are replicated, all the national level actors are replicated below the national level. Um, under its control, the PRC has 22 provinces four provincial level municipalities, five autonomous regions. There are some almost 300 prefectures 
uh, and there are almost 3,000 county level uh, governments in, chi in, in China. Below the county level, there are some 41,000 township level units. Uh, and at this point, two, uh, uh, two points become salient. First, China's state structure is replicated, as I said, throughout this impossible mosaic. And second, each of these localities and administrative levels has its own set of priorities and goals that can, and often do, vary not only with one another's, but most importantly and starkly with Beijing's. Um, you know, Shanglin County, for example, that I mentioned earlier in this talk, is just one of China's 3,000 county level units, uh, and it has wrecked havoc on China's foreign relations <coughs> with Ghana. Let's look at a couple other uh, case studies. Haiyan, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So we've looked at Ghana, uh, and what I want to do in the time that I have left, and I'd like to leave some time for uh, for, for Q&A as well, is to briefly look at uh, three more uh, case studies uh, in not uh, much detail, but at least um, uh, to summarize um, some recent and not so recent <laughs> events there that help illustrate uh, the points that I'm trying to make. Um, they have to do with... Um, um, one example is what I'd call covert uh, BRI in Nicaragua. Um, BRI as a force for destabilization in Myanmar. And then finally, um, the black hands of BRI in Cambodia. So, um, Haiyan, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. I apologize for my cold. Um, so threats... Um, I can, in, in Ghana, you know, threats to the coherence and stability of Beijing's foreign policy are not simply the result of errant entrepreneurs or desperate county governments involved in destructive but ultimately niche activities under the radar. The, um, the uh, Hong Kong Nicaragua Development Corporation or HKND Canal Project in Nicaragua is a case in point. The same year that chinese ghanaian relations were reaching their low point, a private Chinese company revealed its plans for an extraordinarily ambitious <coughs> construction project, a shipping canal, canal to rival the Panama Canal, but no, located in Nicaragua, and able to accommodate ships with greater tonnage. With a price tag estimated at between 40 and $50 billion, the project was slated to include several free trade areas, two ports, tourism zones, airports, and facilities for power generation and transmission. <coughs> the developer, the Hong Kong Nicaragua, uh, the NKAND, uh, was in charge of the project with a number of high profile Chinese state-owned enterprises as partners, including the Chinese Railway Construction Corporation for design work, the China Gajoba Group, which is charged with making equity investments in the project, the Changjiang Institute of Survey Planning and Design and Research, and subsidiaries of the Central State-Owned Enterprises China Communication Construction Group and China Airport Construction Group Corporation, which were responsible for the port and airport components, respectively. Despite all this, the Chinese government itself had denied any link to the project. In Nicaragua itself, there was significant opposition to the proposal. The canal would run through Lake Nicaragua, which is a source of drinking water for the whole country. It would also disrupt the integrity of several national parks, and it would necessitate significant population resettlement. Yet amidst all this, no detailed pro uh, project description was released until preliminary work on the project was already underway. And at the same time, the government awarded the contract to NKND at that time, no environmental assessment had been conducted. There were also questions surrounding investors' ability to see the project through. HKND had no experience in infrastructure construction of such grand scale, and it was unclear how it was able to raise the amount of financing necessary for such an undertaking. This is what suggested that the Chinese state had to be involved. Even as a spokesperson for China's foreign ministry stated in late 2014, quote, the Chinese company's engagement in the Nicaragua project 
is an act of itself and has nothing to do with the Chinese government. This may well have been the case if it referred to the Chinese national government. In any case, these fears turned out to be justified. The project was abandoned in 2020, and HKND's CEO, Wang Jing, unceremoniously vacated his short lease office in Hong Kong's IFC building, leaving no forwarding address. Although unrealized, and perhaps showing ability, Beijing's ability to rein in a project of such visibility, the HKND story is one that leaves a black mark on China's policies in the region. <clears throat> Can I have the next slide, Haiyan? Thank you. Although the situation in Nicaragua was nipped in the bud, the situation in Myanmar, also born from a lack of oversight, has been nothing short of disastrous for China. November 20, uh, 2008 saw China's State Council approve the National Development and Reform Commission's, or NDRC's, recommendation to move forward on the ambitious Mietsone Dam project in Myanmar. But an environmental impact assessment had, had not been conducted prior to approval. Eventually, the Changjiang Institute of Survey Planning, Design, and Research was tasked with uh, coming up with an environmental impact assessment report which it promptly subcontracted to Myanmar's uh, diversity, uh, uh, Biodiversity and Nature Convert uh, Conservation Association, or BANCA. BANCA's preliminary report, hastily drafted in November, October rather, of 2009, concluded that while damage caused by six other Irrawaddy project dams could be mitigated, those associated with the Mitsone Dam could not. As a result, Banka's recommendation was for canceling the Mitsone project and concentrating on the concentration of smaller dams and additional uh, mitigation. The Chinese entity for, responsible for the project, the Yunnan International Power Investment Company, ignored all this, starting construction in December of that same year, three months before the environment, environmental impact assessment had been finalized. The Yunnan International Power Investment Company also failed to consider growing the growing vocal opposition to the Mitsone Dam, which had been op, on, ongoing for the previous half decade from actors within the Kachin state of Myanmar, falsely reporting that Banka had approved the project. It con continued to violate the rules, even as Chinese regulator, regulators recognized the growing danger. Mofcom's uh, uh, um, uh, in, in June 2011, Mofcom explicitly warned that rising societal opposition in Myanmar could lead to the company being targeted by the country's government. Um, the uh, Yunnan uh, International Power Investment Company, CPI, uh, ignored this. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Mofcom did not, it failed to suspend the project, and uh, as it is empowered to do when due diligence rules are violated. Uh, the negative uh, effects of, Mietsone, of the Mietsone Dam into, onto Myanmar's domestic politics was direct and consequential. As Myanmar slowly moves in the direction of post-military rule, it's, uh, it, or at the time, its rulers sought to include and empower its armed ethnic minorities by establishing as border guard forces. Prior to that, however, activists within the Kachin state had rallied around opposing the Mitsone Dam as a way of mobilizing support, arguing that it debased sacred lands while forcing unwanted relocation of the population living within. The effect was not simply to significantly destabilize, well, to quote from George uh, Jones and Joe, uh, Zoe's report in 2017, this movement gradually became part of a power base of group of mid-ranking Kachin independent army uh, officers, KIA officers, disillusioned with their co-opted leaders. The KIA's Young Turks seized control, relaunching its anti-government insurgency. Opposition to the Mietsone Dam thus contributed indirectly but significantly to renewed civil war in Myanmar. The effect was not simply to significantly destabilize Myanmar's domestic politics. It severely damaged the bilateral relations between the two countries and undermined China's international messaging as a better alternative to conditional Western foreign aid and investment. Could I have the next slide, Haiyan, please? 
Thank you. In a far cry from its headier days as an offloading area for arms to communist forces in South Vietnam, Vietnam as a, and as a showcase for Cambodia's oil, oil refinery capabilities, the port city of Sihanoukville, or Preah Sihanouk, also known as Kampong Som, had by the 21st century turned into a sleepy, sleazy destination for Western backpackers, drug addicts, and death pats. A few years later, however, it became a destination for Chinese investment in real estate, casinos, as an offshoot of China's BRI initiatives in the region, including high-speed rail, hydropower, and other infrastructure development. Sihanoukville is Cambodia's only deep water port, making it an important BRI hub in the region. The Chinese population in Cambodia rose from 80,000 uh, in uh, 2013 to a quarter million in just six years, with 80% of them living in Sihanoukville. But it isn't simply Chinese entrepreneurs who are establishing themselves there. They've also been joined by criminal, criminal organizations that are rooted in the Chinese mainland. Most of the Chinese uh, uh, criminal enterprises in Sihanoukville relocated from mainland China after the Chinese government adopted a, a draconian national security law that sought to crack down on criminal syndicates and gangsters. With its weak law enforcement, Sihanoukville became a safe haven in which these non-state actors could thrive. In 2022, reports began to circulate that things had taken an even darker turn. Chinese owned and operated call centers based in Cambodia had transformed residential apartment complexes into heavily guarded and barbed wired detention centers for indentured servants made up from unwitting victims recruited from China, Taiwan, Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, and elsewhere. These people were trained to operate global finan internet financial scams from their cramped apartments and held indefinitely and incommunicado until a, a lucky few were able to escape and tell their stories. When contacted, the Chinese embassy in Phnom Penh claimed ignorance, which, while disingenuous, was also likely at least partially true, as many of these operations were established and continued far outside the established channels of diplomatic communications and or fell through the cracks of China's political landscape. Stories of such forms of gangsterism are not uncommon in China and in the locations on its periphery, like Hong Kong or Macau. The Cambodian experience, however, demonstrates that BRI has facilitated opportunities to export these networks and project them ever further from their original source. Human trafficking originating from China has mushroomed in Southeast Asia more generally, even as Beijing has begun to crack down on these practices. Hayan, can I have the, uh, the, the next slide, please? Thank you. So to conclude, far from a grand strategy, China's international behavior, while taken to include subnational actors operating abroad, is highly unpredictable. What is important is such unpredictability is not a strategic master plan of nine-dimensional chess by foreign policy elites in Beijing but rather the result of China's rough and tumble domestic political ecosystem being internationalized as it extends beyond water's edge and is grafted onto and allowed to shape politics on a global scale. This has implications for the way in which we must study China in the present day, as well as highlighting the importance of the assumptions that we make about China in the policy world. In the case of scholarship, this creates a challenge for the study of China as it lays bare the artificial, artif artificiality of the subdisciplinary distinctions between domestic comparative politics and international relations. Scholars of Chinese domestic politics, that is, through the lens of comparative politics, must now grapple with an ever complex reality in which Chinese, uh, where, where in China, where incentives. Opportunities, sanctions, and institutional pathologies have an international dimension that is no longer sufficient to relegate to the periphery of one's argument or analytical approach. For the international relations scholar, it requires eschewing theoretical elegance by delving into the messy realm of, dom of domestic political structures and processes in China. For policymakers looking at China's international behavior through a framework 
through the framework suggested here complicates the assumptions of intentionality that we ascribe to Beijing. Of course, intentions insofar as they match up to goals are the drivers of politics. But the question becomes, whose intentions? How do the intentions of various national and subnational actors reinforce or alternatively undermine one another? And how much of what they, Chinese actors do in these target countries is not only in opposition to Beijing's international relations policy goals, but is invisible to the elites charged with the actual crafting of China's foreign policy? Finally, what does this framework tell us about Chinese state capacity? In this reading, China appears less than an international juggernaut and more like a hitherto domestic Hobbesian Leviathan increasingly scaled up to the global level. Let me stop here and Haiyan, next slide please. And thank you all very, very much. I'm happy to take questions, comments, pushbacks, critiques, uh, anything that, uh, that you'd like to um, um, uh, to offer. Well, thank you so very much. That was fascinating. Um, we have a stack of questions here. So let's get started. Uh, the ever increasing global temperatures and concentrations of greenhouse gases suggest strongly that humanity will not get ahead of the climate disaster, mass famine and migration. This fact is hiding in plain sight. With that in mind, how does foreign policy of all countries today prepare for the global civilization in decline? That is, it's um, probably one of the most important questions of our time, and um, and at the same time, it's a it's um, it's a bit um, it's a bit um, kind of beyond. Uh, the scope uh, of this talk or my pay grade, but let me let me let, let, let me uh, try to um, um, address it um, with what I've presented here. Um, one of the ways in which um, this a different way of looking at China's domestic political fragmentation and how it affects its um, its it, in ways that has global consequences um, that I didn't really speak about today is has to do with COVID. Um, there is a uh, there is a a a, a complex uh, and and highly politicized conversation in terms of kind of the origins of COVID and what China could have done better, um, what the U.S. could have done better, you know, what the world could have done better. But the I think if you if you take away you know the politics and all of that and you look at the um, and the missed opportunity. What you see is that there are certain ways in which China and the rest of the world, or I should say, kind of the world, you know, with with China as a as a key stakeholder, uh, there are certain policy areas that make a certain amount of sense, um, uh, a political sense, um, you know, as well as well as um, um, uh, speaking to kind of. The, existential crises we all face, you know, global warming being one of them. Um, COVID was a, a natural place where the U.S. and China could work together. Um, you know, it's one of those areas of kind of natural cooperation to try to mitigate the effects of a global pandemic. And yet that issue became politicized. And it became politicized for a number of reasons, but at the origins of that was the fact that China had things in place locally to kind of initially um, provide the information um, that was necessary for people, for decision making makers at the national level to put policies into, into place that were delayed by weeks, even months, which is a lifetime at the very beginning of a, a crisis like that. Um, and that then became itself a political football. So I guess what I'm saying here is that we have to understand kind of what the local politics are and be able to, you know, on you know, on China's side, recognize that, you know, the safeguards that, you know, that that, that we put into place or the policies that we put into place um are are one thing, but how they are actually enforced, how are they implemented, how do they actually, you know, 
to what degree are our people on the ground, you know, at the at, at the you know at the front lines incentivized to do the right thing? And I think from the point of view of those of us kind of working together with China, we have to restrain ourselves from being overly critical because this is something that I think by now we 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 should understand that China is very sensitive about. Won't admit it, but very, very sensitive about. And so these are precisely the types of things that we should be able to talk through together as opposed to talking past one another through um the the you know the the kind of uh, finger wagging and um you know and 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 resulting in kind of the worst possible outcome um and covid you know we all we all experienced it so you don't need me to go into you know any detail there but um you know that is something that is um a, a blip on the screen um when you compare it to you know the full um, uh, potential effects of global warming. Um, and so I am not sanguine. Uh, you know, we, we, this is something where I think on China's side, I think China needs to understand and, you know, admit to, you know, that, you know, the fragmentation that exists therein. And I think on the U.S. side, um, we have to understand that, you know, there, are, we have to, be able to work together uh, for you know these these sets of common goals and china as as fraught as the relationship is right now cannot be excluded um and unfortunately that's not the direction i i i see us going in right now so i wish i could give something uh you know provide something with a you know a little bit of a a more kind of optimistic spin but i really can't um, and I think the story kind of, uh, at least the story that I that, that I tell here, hopefully gives some in indication, um, you know, indirectly, if not directly, as to why that's the case. Thank you. <clears throat> so thank you for a thorough presentation. What specifically would you tell various silos of China watchers, example, Western government, foreign investors, maritime, international peace institutions, et cetera, in conclusion, when Chinese actors are creating aggressive conflicts throughout this well-oiled master plan and fragmented layer of operational machine? Ah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I don't have a, enough time to answer all of it, but I think one of the things that, so one of the things that I, I pointed to in the, in, in the presentation was um, I do try to um, uh, make people aware uh, of the fact that China is not a unitary actor. Um, and one of the things that uh, what that that means is we oftentimes and China does this as, with us as well. Um, uh, they tend to attach uh, a degree of intentionality to what we do, um, and that intentionality oftentimes is um, kind of the result of uh, kind of a, a set of rational rationalist assumptions. When in fact, um, what uh, what happens is something that is um, uh, not that was either unplanned or that it somehow has been um, either deliberately downshifted or is the result of some uh, some 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 actor within the. Uh, you know, within the the, the body politic, um, kind of taking on you know some sort of you know initiative. Um, I think, in terms of the larger you know question, I think what we're what we're doing is we're you know we are, I think, trying to kind of push back in areas where you know China is uh, overly um, opportunistic or or aggressive. Um, but in addition to that, I think what we also need to do is get a sense of kind of what all the and to try to break down what some of these some of the reasons for what China is doing and why um and to um think about uh China in terms of not simply um the leaders in Zhongnanhai and Xi Jinping in particular even though it's something that he's uh you know really tried to do over the past uh a dozen years or so is is really kind of make um China's uh behavior synonymous with um you know Xi Jinping thought or 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 his policy preferences uh and understand that there can be 
um, you know, there can be uh, uh, either uh, mistakes or kind of deliberate Confederate actions uh, that uh, either um, uh, uh, have or have plausible deniability or or don't, uh, but that speak to the fact that this is it's impossible to have um, a you know for China as it as it exists to have a foreign policy that always speaks to decisions made kind of coldly in a calculated fashion um, with you know perfect information and uh, um, and 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 full support. And then this next question is a little bit on the same um, vein of thought, uh, especially since COVID. I don't quite understand China's diplomacy which is very changeable with a lot of inner conflict. I agree that fragmented is the best uh, best to describe it. Uh, at times, significant events are happening. They exhibit a very assertive diplomatic policy, almost war well, wolf warrior style. But during peaceful periods, when cooperation between foreign countries is needed, they seem very humble. At the same time, regardless of the type of foreign policy pursued, there's always an encouragement of nationalism domestically and inciting populism to foreign countries. Often that this occurs when the government is least confident in its political stance. Is the top-down centralized policy, is that because of the top-down centralized policy? What are your thoughts? That's a great question, um, and uh, uh, I, I, um, I, I, I'm really glad that you noted the sense of confidence. Um, I think there is, and, and, and this is, you know, we're really talking about, um, you know, kind of grand strategy here. Um, but I think one of the things that we see in China is both a sense of confidence that is, I think, well, um, you know, uh, um, you know, well earned. But we also see the vestiges of um, a, a a lack of confidence that uh, really uh, emerged, you know, more than a century ago, um, and has been part of the kind of the national self narrative ever since. Um, and I think that um, what we may see now within China is, you know. Uh, official rhetoric notwithstanding, uh, I think there is a widespread sense of malaise of um, what life is, you know, what what, what life is going to be like, you know, in, in the years and, um, you know, decade or so ahead. Um, uh, as uh, when I was in China in November, every conversation I had with every single person without, you know, without, um, without exception, uh, was one in which they bemoaned the economic situation in China and how it was worse than it had ever been uh, in a qualitative way. Uh, interestingly enough, they these are people in my own you know demographic, so kind of middle aged. You know, they were saying that things are fine as far as they're concerned. They have the you know they have the apartment, they have the car, they you know, but they're worried about uh, younger folks. Um, there, there is this, this I, I wasn't there long enough to really get a, a feel for it, but I do get a sense of, you know, you, you don't have the kind of dynamism um, and the kind of optimism or the kind of room for growth that you had, um, you know, say 15 years ago or so. And so as a result, I think there may be a, a relative lack of confidence uh, within the Chinese body politic. Uh, and whether or not the leadership is reading that or not, um, it is you know one of the kind of the, one of the responses to something like to to that kind of a, a societal malaise is the um, is is nationalism. You know, it's it's there. It's it's uh, you know you can always tap into that, and I think we're seeing a fair amount of that. Um, but at the same time, what we're not seeing is there's a lot of discourse within China. Uh, that is saying, why are we, you know, why are we investing abroad in all these places when we've got, you know, parts of China that really need this kind of investment, you know, very similar to things that we see in in, in the U.S. Um, uh, we see China, you know, very much uh, trying to place itself as the as as the leader of the global South. Many Chinese, particularly China's middle class, don't want to be, that's not who they want to be self-identified with. They, uh, and so I think what we really have is a, a system where um, 
the increase in kind of top-down control is only allowing these, it is it is not allowing the kind of safety valve for, <coughs> um, or pressure valve rather, for a lot of these, um, these other types of um, uh, expressions of, of of unhappiness and uh, and uh, dissatisfaction uh, to emerge, and so what we're what we're seeing is something that is I, I think is inaccurate, um, and with something that's that's kind of brewing you know, below the surface. I don't recall China being like this since say when I was there in 1988 or when I was there immediately post Tiananmen in 1991. Um, it's, it's, it's something I think that we really need to be uh, aware of. Um, and, um, you know, the system, you know, the people uh, at the top are in control, but I do feel that the, the system is not only fragmented, but also brittle. Um, and uh, I, I, I wish I could say more, but um, I'm, I'm uh, unfortunately, I feel like uh, I, I'm out of time. You are out of time, we're past time, but I'll, I'll give you one softball here. What on the horizon as a China expert it is important to you? What are your wildest dreams of a policy research topic right now? I'm sorry? What is your wildest dream of a policy research topic right now? Ah, <sighs> so... First of all, there's no such thing as a China expert. Anybody who, you know, who who cops to that, you know, is is not one. Um I I would really really like to get a a, a sense of what what are the what are the people who are in the middle of the system? To what degree are they I guess I didn't expect this question, so it's it, it has the opposite effect. But I think what I, what I would do is I'd really be interested in in in, in having uh, as full access as possible to look at the relationship between kind of what the party in China believes as an organization. Um, to what degree does it do, you know do do the true believers there feel that they deviated from their mission uh, under Xi Jinping? Um, and, um, you know, that's something that I, I, I would really, really like to, um, uh, you know, I mean, I think that's, that's really at the core of, you know, what we're likely to see next in terms of whether there's a restoration or a continuation or, 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 or a break with, uh, with the past whenever uh, Xi Jinping, um, you know, uh, exits the scene, but I guess, let me just leave it there. And we'll invite you back to talk about that then. Then, <laughs> So thank you so very much today. Uh, and everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you at the next webinar. We'll let you know when that happens uh, soon. Um, thanks again, everybody. Have a good day.